comes into worship this morning. May I say to you that being a dad isn't for the weak. Not a W-E-E-K. You can't be weak. W-E-A-K. Because dad is a lifetime commitment. Just like a mom, we don't ever stop being a dad. For most of us, it just transfers to being a granddad. Or maybe a great-granddad. Or if your quiver is really full, a great-great-granddad. Whatever the case may be, it's good. And it's an honor to be so. One day a little boy was asked to define Father's Day, and he said it's, it's just like Mother's Day, only you don't spend as much money on the presents. <laughs> it has been said that if we as men, as fathers, lead godly lives, then it's very likely that our children will do also. You know, I, I got a bunch of information that I've tried to decide where I can share it. But most of you know there is a phrase that's going around our society today called toxic, toxic uh, masculinity. And it's really just an attack on, on men, on manhood, on what it is to be a man. And there's a lot of information out there. I thought maybe I could wedge it in uh, in my Father's Day message, but I realized that I could uh, to do it justice and really get the uh, point across. I, I know men have made mistakes, and I know sometimes men can be difficult, ladies, but to want to strip away a man's identity, to shame him for being who God created him to be is something totally indifferent. I want to bring to you, Dennis uh, Rainey wrote a book called Manhood by the Bible. And he touches on these five areas that I just want to share with you today. Maybe you can go out and buy the book. It's a great book to read. Uh, a man, number one, he outlines five things. Number one, a man keeps his emotions and passion in balance. Number two, a man provides for his family. Number three, a man protects his family. Number four, a man serves and leads his family. And number five, a man follows God's design for true masculinity. Now, we live in a day today where men are told that they don't have to uh, support these roles. As a matter of fact, I was alarmed. Uh, Tucker Carson brought out a report that said 70% of homes today do not have a father figure in it. In it. Uh, it's shocking to realize that we men have taken our jobs to life. And I believe that God's Word gives us instructions on how to be a dad, how to be a grandfather. Now, uh, someone noticed that the word father appears in the dictionary just before the word fatigue. And just after the word fathead. So to all of us fatigued fathead fathers, happy Father's Day. Amen. Amen. We're so glad you're here. You know, I recently was reading off of a website that talked about kids speak different languages today, which makes it maybe be a little bit harder on, on dads to be the dad and to be the great communicators. Now, moms do a lot better job of listening sometimes. Remember I shared with you in church about selective hearing? You know how us guys sometimes have that uh, gift? But, uh, you know, sometimes our children talk about things or share things and we have to kind of look at them and try to scratch our head and wonder what they're talking about. It's like, if you watch this automobile repair uh, show that's come out here recently, I, I listened to some English people and they you know, they, hey, Americans and English are supposed to really speak English, but uh, I noticed on this car show that when uh, um, Americans say bonnet, that they mean something dressy that a lady wears on their head. But in this car show, this guy said, well, let's raise the bonnet. And uh, what they mean is raise the hood of the car. 
Now, I don't know if that's English, but that's not the way we talk here. So there can be confusion in our language. So the same is true when we're talking about children. Like when a child says, I didn't do it. Uh, translation, uh, it has not been proven consensually that I really did that. Number two, when your child says, Frankie Smith is a no good rotten liar, Dad. Expect a call from Frankie's parents because your son has just done something. Number three, mom said it's okay. Translation, dad, I'm going to ask mom as soon as you say yes, and then I will tell her, well, dad said yes. I know our children have never done that. But. Or number four, dad, can I have a dog? Yeah, meaning your son wants a dog. Dad, can I have a boa constrictor? Meaning, your son really wants a dog, but he figured asking for something really awful that will put him in a better bargaining position. So, yes, I think that all parents can testify that our children and grandchildren do speak a different language from us. But I, I, I want to clarify and give us some uh, man stuff out of God's Word, both to fathers and to grandfathers about some things that I think we can do and we can do to make ourselves better parents, better grandparents. There's a wonderful wisdom word in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Most of you probably know this by heart. But it says this, Bring up a child in the way that he should go, and when they are old, they should not depart soon from it. Now, I know that there are some here this morning you might be thinking, well, Pastor, you don't, you don't know uh, uh, my children. And I don't know about that scripture. You know, we love our children and, and, and grandchildren. And we treat them well. And yet, sometimes they do turn away from us. Sometimes they journey on roads that, that we're not fond of. But I do believe at the end, after they have journeyed some, that if the foundation is laid well, if you are there to always extend a hand to them, I know there's times when we must give tough love. But I'm reminded of the example that Jesus used about the prodigal son. That we hope and pray one day they'll return. In church, that's why we need to pray. And we need to continue to pray for our children and grandchildren because the world has changed. It has changed drastically. Things that we could never imagine are happening today. You know, I, I think back on my growing up days. Uh, if you remember the television, for most of us, if you lived in a uh, home like I did, uh, the remote control was your children. Dad or mom said, so we can go turn on channel two. And you went to the TV and you turned the clicker. Now, some of you don't even remember or even know what I'm talking about. But, but that's the way it was today. Uh, a radio, you know, it, uh, I remember uh, when, I'm dating myself, but when transistor radios really become popular, and I thought that was so cool to be able to carry my AM, AM transistor radio around, and I thought that was really neat. Nowadays... They have TV, internet, radio, uh, YouTube. They have it all on one little thing called a smartphone, right? So I don't know how I would have reacted, maybe the way they did, I don't know. But what I'm trying to say is that the devil has more avenues to reach the minds of our children and our young people than ever before. And mom and dad, grandma and grandfather, I encourage you today that don't be ashamed, but a part of training up a child is also helping to steer them. And to steer them, you've got to have your eyes open. You've got to be looking. In other words, you've got to monitor a little bit, all right, to help give them the way they should go. Now, remember I said being a father isn't for a week, for a week. All right? It takes a great commitment to be a dad. We must make time 
for our children. It doesn't matter if they're young, now let me say this, or they're old. We always need to listen. If we are not listening when they're young, and I've warned you of this before, you know that time when they have a thousand questions? You know when they keep coming up to you and ask, well, why? Or they ask you about this, and they ask you about that, and they keep asking and asking, and you're busy, and you're wanting to do this, or you want to do that. I, I remember my father had the patience of Job. I mean, listen, I'd go fishing with him, and all I wanted to do is talk to him. And I know that my father wanted to throw me off the boat. But, but you know, if you don't listen to them dads and moms when they're young, they won't want to talk to you when it's really most important. They won't ask you the questions that you really want them to ask you so that you can give them your thoughts. And so I encourage you to take the time because it has been proven that children that are ignored by their parents become frustrated, they become angry, they become distant, they alienate themselves from us, and it's sad to say, they alienate themselves from God oftentimes. It is not for weak people. Being a mom and dad is tough. It is not a perfect thing. There are no perfect parents. Yes, we make mistakes, but I tell you what, if we are honest before our children, let them know that we are also human, that we make mistakes also. I think you can have a relationship with your son or your daughter that will last. And they may drift, they may walk away, but eventually I believe they will come back to you and you'll be able to have that relationship. So, let me give you some other things here. The first thing, men, ask men, we must actually live godly lives. Now, it's one thing to tell our children to do as I do. That's a big thing. Don't just tell them to do what I say. you got to do and live what you're telling them how to do it. So we must live godly lives, men. We must keep promises concerning our relationship with the Lord. Don't expect your child to go to church. If you don't have any concern or care for church yourself. If you act like it is a labor to come to church, guess what? When your children are able to make that decision on their own, it will be a labor to them also. Dads, we not only need to keep our promises and concerning our relationships to the Lord, but we also need to keep our promises with our family. We need to. We need, our children need to know that, Dad, you're a man of your word. And see, that way, when things get tough, when you tell them something, they will know they may not agree with it, they may not like it, but if you have been a man of your word, and you live the way you believe in, and you live that day by day, listen, they will may not like to listen to you, but they will respect you. So be a man of your word. And then also be a faithful, spiritual head of your family. You see, you can't tell your kids, you know what, you need, have you read your Bible this week? Because they've been acting like heathens, so you want to, did you read your Bible? Or, you know, did you listen to the Sunday school teacher? I don't think you heard a thing that she said. And they see you coming to church, and you're out there doing or scrolling. I used to have somebody, and I won't say what church it was, but they used to kind of sit like in that area. And I would watch them, and I knew they weren't taking notes. They were doing it. Because they would turn their bulletin this way, and I'd see them go like this and like this. Now let me tell you something. Dad, if that's what you're doing, don't expect your child to pay attention to the preacher or the Sunday school teacher <laughs> when it's most important. Second, as men, we must commit ourselves to building strong relationships with our talents, with our means, and with prayer. It, what I'm trying to say is, guys, we, we've got to put into action what we say with our mouth. If you want to teach your children how to live as a follower of Christ, then you've got to be out front. You've got to commit yourself. 
Third, as men of Christ, we need to devote ourselves to our community. In other words, they need to say you, see you sharing Jesus. You know, we want, uh, we, we say we believe in the Great Commission, but if our children ever see you witness, what are they going to think? And, and also, what kind of witness is it when, you know, you, you, you go to uh, McDonald's and drive up and the girl happens to, you know, you give her a 10, and the child's old enough to know uh, the difference when the girl says, sir, that's $8.75 and you give her a 10. And she gives you a $20 bill and something back and your child's sitting there looking at you and you kind of sheepishly say, ha, 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 I guess we got that for free. Now, what kind of lesson are we teaching them? So it's important as we tell our children that we live devoted lives to what we say and what we believe. I believe the result of that will not only be a renewal in our own life, but it will bring renewal to our family. It will bring renewal to our churches. If godly men will live godly lives, you'll see the change that it makes in every aspect of our community. Not only in here, but out there. Another thing that men, we need to work on before our children, and that is our marriages. We need to be, as best as possible, successful in our marriages. You see, because that hangs upon two hands. Number one, first and foremost, it hangs on the hand of God. And secondly, in our hands. If we will follow our life after the Lord Jesus Christ, then we can build our marriages and we can build our homes and thus our children will see what goes on in the behind the closed doors of our house. What am I saying? You can't come to church and be smiling and go home and yell and scream and beat on your family. You know, I, I again, I have a lot of references, but I was at a church one time where the family just about got into a fight the husband and wife, and one of the older kids got involved in it. And when it came to find out what the, I mean, because they were yelling. I mean, they were screaming in the church parking lot, right, as people were leaving the church, okay. They were by their cars, yelling. And you know what it was? Whether or not they were going to Burger King or McDonald's. <laughs> and, and, and they had their three children right next to them. And I thought for a moment, what, what kind of lesson are we living? What kind of lesson are we teaching? So there again, dads, moms, it's important that we live our lives before our children. Now, men, not only do we need to live godly lives before our children, but we need to do it before our wives as well. You see, that's, that's how our sons learn how to treat their future wives and, and daughters. That's, that's how uh, our daughters learn what kind of man they want to marry. So we have a, a tough job. Now, there are times, talking about communication with our wives, that uh, guys, what we say and what we mean don't always come together. Let, let, ladies, let, ladies, let me translate this for you. When a man says, you know, he's doing something or whatever, and the wife comes up and begins to ask questions. And a man says, uh, you know, she says, well, well, honey, what, what, what are you doing? Or why are you doing it the way you're doing it? A man who says it would take long to, too long to explain, dear, generally means I don't have any idea how it works. I'm just doing it, faking it, all right? Or when a man says, take a break, honey, you're just working too hard. What he's really saying is, honey, would you stop doing that vacuum so I can hear the TV? <laughs> or, or, when he says, I heard you, I really did. What it means is, I have the foggiest clue what you just said. And I'm hoping desperately that I can fake it well enough that you will not spend the next three days telling me that I never listened to you. Nobody's ever done that in this church, I have. Or when a guy says, oh, 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 that's not what I meant. What he means is, if something that I've said 
can be interpreted two other ways, and the one way makes you sad or angry, and the other way makes you happy, I meant that one. All right, you, you, this, I know I'm just a bunch of perfect playmates here. I, I would just relate that to somebody on the internet that might be watching. I, seriously. In Ephesians, and again in the Colossian, Paul shares the word that he received from the Lord concerning uh, being a parent. He, he writes this, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your mother and your father, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go right with you and that you may enjoy long life on this earth. Now, uh, young people, teenagers, and young folks, that's a very important passage of Scripture for you to understand. Children, obey your parents. Y y you see, taking in consideration that I said parents are not perfect, young people, you need to give us a break too. Mom and Dad don't always get it right, but you have a responsibility to honor, in other words, to respect and to love your parents, whether they're right or they're wrong. Because it is, now all, all the young people here, you know, that want to live a long life, here's the answer. The first commandment with a promise. First commandment that says, you may live and enjoy a long life on this earth. But then it writes, Dad, let me go back to you. <coughs> it says here, Fathers, do not provoke your children. In other words, don't exasperate them. That's a, that's a big word. It doesn't, what it means is not to poke them. <coughs> In other words, there's one thing to tell somebody what to do and how to do it. It's another thing not to continually nag them and nag them and nag them and nag them. And sit there and point out, you didn't do this right. You didn't do that right. You should have done it. Sometimes you have to let them make a mistake all on their own. My dad did that several times. He'd say, son, I don't want you to do this, but I'm going to let you do it. And usually... Usually, 9.99 .99 times out of 100, my father was right. If I would have done it the way my dad said it to do the first time, I may have not gotten in trouble. And so, what we have to do, fathers, is to not provoke. In other words, don't push our children to anger. <coughs> but to train them as the Lord, with love, with concern, as they would live. Now, here's some last words. When Solomon says, don't provoke or <coughs> exasperate, I think he has the idea more of leading, showing. My grandfather was a great one to do that. Is my father, grandfather, rather just say, uh, you know, put this here, put that there, do this and that. He would get you, and he would then show you how to do it. Uh, Brother uh, Charles, he, uh, of course, they didn't use PVC pipe back in those days. You know, it was all galvanized pipe. And, uh, but my grandfather would say, okay, you know, measure twice and cut once, you know. Uh, but he would show me how to put something together, how to, how to maybe sweat a copper pipe or how to do something. And it was really great. And he didn't expect you to do it the very next time. He would take you on several events, and he would let you do one piece at a time. Okay, take this uh, uh, knuckle and put it on this pipe. And I'm going to put the pipe dope or whatever. I'm going to show you, and, and now you do this one. And, and then he'd let you do one. Then he'd show you again. And he was continually to teach in that way till he felt you was able to to do it. So when we talk about that, it's important to lead as well and to teach. Parenting is never easy, like I said before. It has an incredible challenge 
It has an incredible challenge rearing children today like never before. Now, I've got a, a, a touching story that I want to share with you about a son and his father. Some time ago, there was written this article uh, about a humble but a consecrated pastor whose young son had become very, very ill. After his son had undergone an exhaustive series of tests, the father was told the shocking news that his son had terminal illness. The youngster had accepted Christ as his Savior. So this father knew that the death of his son would be one that would usher him into the glory of God. But he wondered how he was going to tell his son what was going to happen. How was he to tell his son that they had done all they could do and that he would pass away very quickly? He thought, well, should I just ignore it and just let it happen? But he said, there's one thing that my son knows is that I'm very honest. And he said, I, I wanted, and he said, my son to know that it didn't have to be scary. That, that death was just a doorway to usher him in to the presence of God. And so he went to his son's bedside. He read him a passage of scripture and he had a time of prayer with his son. Then he gently put his arm uh, underneath his son's head and healed him while he lay in his hospital bed. The doctors promised him and told him that everything would be okay, but that death would come. And so the father compassionately went to his boy and said, Are you afraid to meet Jesus? And wiping a few tears from his eyes, the, the, little fan, the little guy looked at his dad and he says, No, not at all. As long as Jesus is just like you, Daddy. That father had spent his life being a dad. And when it came to that moment, that father was the image of who God was. And dads, I, I say that to you. Grandfathers, I say that to you. And this is no disrespect or heresy. But when our children are young and our grandchildren are young, they ought to be able to look at us and see the image of Jesus Christ. It's okay for our children to look at us and say, Dad, you're just like God, aren't you? I don't know of a better compliment that our children could give us than to truly see Jesus in our lives, that we have modeled the image of Christ in who they see. Now let me say this. <clears throat> Dads, maybe you're here this morning and your children are grown. Maybe, maybe they've been gone out of your house for quite some time. Maybe you don't have the influence that you once had over them in their lives. It's never too late. Do you hear me? I believe with all my heart you can go back to those children and you can say, Dad just wants to say something. Maybe I wasn't the father I once was or should have been. Maybe I didn't stay at home. Maybe I wasn't an example. But I want to ask your forgiveness. And I want to let you know from this day forward, I'm going to do the best that I can to be the man of God that I can be before you. You see, because God is a God of second chances. And I can't think of a greater illustration to give our children of how God and our Lord Jesus Christ forgives us and allows us to begin over than to, with our children, 
Start that relationship. Let them know that, listen, from this day forward, I'm going to be, if you allow me, I want to be the dad. I want to be the godly uh, example that I want to be. Because this is a commitment that I've made to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a commitment that I am making to you. It's not for the weak. It's not easy. There are no perfect parents, no perfect dads. But we can be a father, a dad, that lives the best godly life that we can. For our children, whether they be young or old, men, be a dad, be a leader, be responsible, be accountable. But most of all, walk the walk to give glory and honor to our Jesus. Amen.